Oh, I am excited about today. Well, firstly, I'm already going to have to give an assignment. Can anybody go into the resource room up in the children's department, break in there, and find a ball, a playground ball, a basketball, a volleyball, a soccer ball, something of that size? If you can... There's a million brownie points waiting for you. I'm just kidding. If you can, it would be really helpful for an illustration. All right. The Lord dropped that in my heart as pastor was ministering. So we're going to obey the Lord. Whoever said church was boring? It isn't boring boring here, that's for sure. Oh, my gosh. I was laughing so hard. You guys are absolutely hilarious. Oh, my goodness. You got to take that show on the road. And so this is our first service, our first gathering, our first assembly, right, of 2023. Can you believe it? Can you believe that we are even here? It's just such a, I don't know, it's kind of a surreal time, isn't it? And so it's interesting as... uh, you know, we're preparing and laying out the year and and just uh, praying and seeking the Lord. He has begun to drop some things in our heart in a really fresh new way and challenge us to believe him for more, yeah. believe him for expansion, believe him for growth. Well, what does that mean? Firstly, that means personally, firstly, right? That means growth in him uh, firstly. And so we've been doing some things, Pastor and I, we've been doing some things like, I don't know if we've mentioned before, but the author Caleb Moran, we've been talking with him on the phone and getting some personal coaching. And he's got a consulting firm that goes in and helps churches uh, specifically break through the 250 mark. How many would, would love to see 250 people come to the kingdom of God? Amen. And just this last weekend, I won't name names, Uh, But I had somebody uh, send a text and they said, uh, pastors, can you believe for 10 new families this year? Absolutely. Absolutely. We can believe for 10 new families. My response was, are you praying that way? Yeah. You calling them in? Yes. Yes. And I know this person is. And so we've been reading some things on leadership, right? We've been devouring the word on these truths because, oh, and it's the perfect person that went and found the ball. And so I'm going to have Haley help me here in just a moment. Is that cool? All right. Oh, it's a flat ball too, but we'll still pass just fine. And so, uh, you know, it's important for us to understand that unless we change and grow, we won't change and grow unless we make a decision to do just that. So we were in one of our uh, coaching sessions with Caleb Moran, and he's in his 40s. Now, we could adopt this mentality, well, we're beyond him. We've been in the ministry longer than him. We could develop that attitude, couldn't we? But that would be foolish. This young man has done some significant things in the kingdom of God, and there are some things that we need to learn from him. And so, as he's uh, talking with us, at the end of our hour, he says, well, I've been assessing you, and in essence, it's this. Whether or not it's worth the time to come and invest in us and in this church. Because the question is, are we willing to change and therefore be positioned to grow? So he made note of the fact that we passed that test, which was hugely helpful. And one of the things, thank you, you can just leave it right there, hon. Um, One of the things that I think is really important is being transparent and honest. And if you guys know us by now, you know what? We're convinced that God can't do a thing with us if we're not transparent and honest before him, right? But when we come before him, if you will, proverbially naked before him and say, Lord, this is, this is where I'm at. I need your help. Well, there in that place, he can meet us, right? And so Haley, would you help me with this for a second? And so Over the last couple of weeks, we've we've had a a lot of time with our grandkids, and um, and so I've had the opportunity to go to some of our grandsons' basketball games, 
And it was interesting for a 14, almost 15 year old, he's very astute, he's very aware. And he has three different coaches, right? And so when he's sharing with me about these three different coaches, they all have different methods. They all have different emphases, right? There's different things that they purpose to put them to practice. They all have different disciplines that they're, they're really strong in and some areas where they're weaker in. And he was able to make note of how each one coached, okay? Each one was very, very different. And so I said to him, do you like one more than the other? It was a test. And you know, his response was, bless my heart. He said, no, I need what all three of them have. That's wisdom for a young man. It really is. And so as I'm watching them, I don't know how many of you have ever played basketball, specifically basketball. I have to chuckle. Michelle, you've played basketball. That is hilarious. I love it. Obviously, we are not the center. Anyway, you tiny little dribbler. You're the guard. You are the starting center. No, you are not. Okay. I was going to say. <laughs> well, wonders never cease. That's hilarious. All right. And so if I were to receive the ball, if I were to receive the ball, I don't know if I can do this with a mic, but we're going to try it. Sure. Okay, so obviously a pass would be a harder pass, but I'm going to what? I'm going to receive that pass with one foot planted, right, so that I can what? Pivot, right? So I can pivot. And so it's important for me to receive what it is that's being passed to me in a way that I'm ready to receive it and I'm ready to pivot and run with it. And it's that way in God, right? It's just that way in God. When we're just standing unaware, and you see kids out on the court like that, you know, just kind of unaware, just not ready, and the ball comes to them, and sometimes smack them right in the face, right? It's right there before them, but they're not ready to receive it. They're certainly not ready to pivot, and they're not ready to head down the court to do what? The end goal is to make the basket, make the point. Thank you so much, Haley. That was so sweet. And so, Guys, I believe this. I believe this morning is really important, and I'm going to come to you more as a coach today. Is that good? Is that good? Can you receive in that way? And so it's going to be a little different thrust, and we're going to talk about some things that I trust will inspire you toward the dreams that God has placed in your heart, all right? Wonderful time of the year. We know that in God, there's an opportunity to have a fresh start every day, every day, every day, right? But there's a wonderful time of the year called the first part of the year that we can lay that side, that time aside and we can seek our Father. And so I'm going to trust him and would you just agree together with me for utterance today that we can get exactly what it is that he desires for each of us and the ones that are even in the hospital recovering right now. Matter of fact, the Lord impressed upon me this morning, you need to take church later today that a specific one needs to receive in the hospital room. Just take church right to them. Amen. And we're just going to go minister with them. And so how important this is. So I want to submit this idea to you if you're taking notes and I trust that you are all right, that you and I have the capacity to reinvent ourselves, to reinvent ourselves. And so today's passage is talking about the difference between a dreamer that never does and a dreamer that's also a doer, okay? So I might be tagging some of us. I certainly have been tagging myself in certain areas of life, right? I believe this, we can grow in certain areas of life, and there are other areas of life that we can remain kind of, how should I say, not much forward momentum happening in those areas. And they can become areas that drag us down, that weigh us down, that are points of frustration. And we want to move forward in God. And I'm going to tell you this, guys, as I'm coaching you today, if you'll receive this word and leave here today and apply it, it'll literally change your life. We say it all the time, don't we? but I mean it for real. We have to apply it. If you hear it and you never do anything with it, nothing will change. The end of your 2023 will look exactly like it looks right now. Exactly. But God is faithful. He is absolutely faithful to watch over his word 
even that specified word that he's already planted in your heart. And I pray by the spirit of God that he's bringing that up to your remembrance, reminding you of what it is that he's called you to do. Okay. So some people throughout the Bible were given dreams. So let's look. Abraham had a dream and a vision from God, didn't he? He would be the father of many nations. How long did it take for that to come to pass? Anybody know? 25 years, 25 years. And even though there were points in the beginning that he laughed at God because it was what? Impossible. At the end of it, he's chronicled in the Hall of Faith chapter as having what? Great faith because he dared to believe God. I love that, that God saw the end result and he never, he, he, Put it in the word to let us know he too was human, but he only chronicled, if you will, or recorded the outcome. Isn't that good to know for us? Joseph, right, who many years later became second only to Pharaoh, had a dream forth telling his future, affecting his family and his nation. However, he told his dream to who? The wrong people out ahead of time, and he got conceited and puffed up by it right? He was immature at the time of receiving it. And yet when he fulfilled it, God had matured him through some hardship and adversity. It's not that we sign up for hardship and adversity, but I'm telling you what, if we go through it with God, we'll come out the other side having been made better because of it, or perhaps even in spite of it. All right. Number three, Daniel, right? Had dreams from God, literal dreams from God. Fourthly, Joseph, the stepfather of Jesus, had a directive dream, right, to protect Jesus. And so God can speak to his people in dreams in a myriad of different ways, whether it be that he plants a dream seed in your heart, there's just a knowing by way of the spirit, right? Or whether it's that you literally have a dream while you're asleep, or you have perhaps an open eye vision where you see something, the Lord just shows you something by way of his spirit, and he begins to work that thing in you that you're caused, how should I say, you're being caused to have faith rise up in you to dare to believe him for that thing. And so I'll say this, if there's something that you're looking at doing, and man, you, you need to hear this today. This is for somebody. If there's something that you're looking at doing and you're assessing it and you're saying this, I can do that. I can almost guarantee that's not God. If you can do it apart from God and it requires no faith, you'll not have to lean on him. You'll not have to be dependent on him. And he will always call, cause us to be in a place where we have to lean hard into him. And it's a great place to live. It's a wonderful place to live. We are helplessly dependent upon him, not in our own strength, if you and I can assess it and say, well, I can finish that, I can do that, I can pay for that, I can make that happen, I don't have to believe God for it, and I've heard Christians say that very thing, thankfully nobody here, but I've heard people say that, you know, I have it in the bank, not a problem, or I've heard this on the contrary, I got to believe God again, I got to dare to believe him again, as if a stretch of their faith, right? is an arduous, hard thing. Man, what an opportunity for us to grow. What an opportunity for us to grow. And so then in Joel chapter 2, if we can get it on the screen, that would be fantastic. And we're going to read it in context. I encourage you to read the whole of chapter 2 at a later time. And it says this, And it shall come to pass afterward, and that afterward is talking about some prophetic things to come, that I will pour out my spirit on how many, fl how, how, all flesh, right? So is it just the church that the spirit of God is going to be poured out on? What does it say? All flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy or give inspired utterance. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see what? Visions, right? So that, does that mean specifically that only old men are going to have dreams. Nobody else is going to have a dream planted in their heart. Well, no, of course not, right? 
but he's giving an understanding that everybody is going to receive the spirit of God and supernatural things are going to happen up and out of that or outpouring. And it's talking about a specified time in the last days. Look at Acts chapter 2. We're going to start here in verse 14. So this is Peter 11 days, 11 days after Peter said for the third time that he denied Christ. And all of a sudden, Peter has an audience. He has an opportunity to now preach Christ instead of denying him. But Peter, it says, standing up with the 11, raised his voice and said to them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. Verse 15, for these are not drunk as you suppose. What was he talking about? The outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, chapter 2, the beginning of chapter 2, right? And as a result, the manifestation was they all spoke in tongues or other languages as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. There was a supernatural occurrence that had been prophesied and promised, and it was now happening. Look at this. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day or 9 o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken by the prophet. Prophet Joel. I love it the way it says it in the King James. Go back to 16. And the way it says it in the King James, but this is that, that thing. So he's pointing back to Joel, right? This minor prophet in the Old Testament. But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It's now happening. Look at this. And it shall come to pass in when? The last days says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Interesting that the word order is changed a little bit there from Joel. Look at verse 18. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, those that are serving the Lord, right? We can be children of God, right? And not necessarily be servants of God, not necessarily be in the house serving God. But on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in when? Those days, and they shall prophesy, give inspired utterance. We're going to read on the last two verses. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. Lots of different Bible scholars translate that all kinds of different ways. We won't go into that today. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great, excuse me, before the coming, it's cut off in the back, of the great and awesome day of the Lord, before the coming of the Lord. So it's telling us the time, the swath of time that these things will be unfolding before us. Guys, we're living in this time. This is exciting to be alive in just such a time. I love what Reggie brought to the table this morning. It doesn't matter. He's absolutely right because God is with us. He has designed us to be here for just such a time. And so look at this. Mm -mm -mm. As we purpose to call this corporate fast, okay, as a church, I believe this. The Lord said some things to me very specifically. And firstly, it was this. It was a fast to be called corporately to refresh. And I began to think about the modernized use of that word or that term to be refreshed, right? If my electronics need to be refreshed, what happens? Can anybody explain that to me? You can say it out loud. Right. Well, what happens as a result? What, what is the goal to have your electronics refreshed? Keep it running, right? Absolutely. To keep it running. And so it reboots it, it upgrades it, and it oftentimes can even reimagine a reinvention. It's sometimes a new point of software even, right? If you're doing an update. And so this is important for us to fast, to refresh. And there's a singular word that the Lord keeps speaking to my heart regarding this fast, and it is obedience. Not even discipline. It's obedience. It's obedience. I, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself on that, but I will say this. As the world grows darker, guys, the church should be growing brighter, sharper, more keen, and more sensitive to the Spirit of God's leading. 
Because there is coming a day when you and I will have opportunity to make hard decisions for Christ. And if we're not keen and sensitive in the spirit, it will be easy to be led by the flesh rather than by the spirit of God. So now in this time, we have the opportunity to train our human spirits so that part of us, who we really are, is the dominating force. Does it make sense? All right. Hmm. So one efficient and effective way to move over into this you're all so quiet, it's great, <laughs> is to develop this kind of hearing by employing a lifestyle of fasting, a lifestyle of fasting. And I'm going to stand before you today and I'm going to say this, I never in a million years would have thought that I would be teaching anything on fasting, really, because I would run from it, like run. If I heard the word, nope, nope, I don't even want to hear it. It was that much of a hold on me. So this spiritual discipline, right? There are spiritual disciplines that we have afforded to us. Study, meditating on the word, worship, prayer, and then fasting. And so we're going to employ this. So this coming Tuesday as a birthday present to me, I am inviting you and asking you to come on this journey with me too fast to refresh, okay? We can all choose one day, three day, 10 day, 21 day, whatever the spirit of the Lord tells you. But I want to interject this. The Bible only calls us to a fast from what? Food, food, right? It doesn't say fast Xbox. It doesn't say fast video games because obviously none of those things were existent in that time. But it could be that something like that, right? could have captured or garnered our attention to the point that it's stealing our time and it's dulling our spiritual senses, okay? So it's a good exercise for us to teach the flesh where it needs to remain, which is nailing its hide to the wall, crucifying the flesh every day, not allowing it to have its way all the time because it will always bark its demands, always. It wants its way, not just with food, because the lusts of the flesh are plentiful, plentiful. And what it wants, it wants it now, and it wants more of it, and more of it. And when we give into it a little bit, it wants more of it. Because man, when I gave that person a piece of my, you know, my mind, I wanted to go even further. I wanted to give them a little bit more. Why? Because the flesh is making its demand. Yeah. For sure. So I'm going to tell you a story. This is a great story. Brody is, he is the best. He is becoming as comedic as the rest of the family, I'm telling you. So he goes, Mimi, I got a story for you. And I thought, oh boy. So he goes, dad and I, we went to pick up dinner and we're going through the Taco Bell line. And the young man through the speaker, he's doing this. What else? What else? What else? Which was irritating my son-in-law. Okay. And so Brody says, I'm watching my dad, and I'm watching the slow simmer increase as this young man is, what else? You know, not having, obviously. He's just really not into it, not, not into his job. So when they got to the window, apparently Chris felt that he needed to share with him proper manners, and what a better way would be to offer good customer service. Okay. And so he shared with this young man, to which Brody was like, I wanted to slump down in the seat, but it's good. And so we went on home, and you know, at about five o'clock, 5.30, their house gets real busy, everybody's coming in, you know, sometimes they'll just have food on the counter, and everybody's grabbing something to eat, and Candace had come in, and Haley had come in, and apparently Candace had come in and needed to leave right away, our daughter. And so she had taken her whatever it was, out, had taken a bite of it, but she had to fly. So she rolled it back up and put it back in the bag. Okay. And so nobody's aware of this, and she flew out the door. So Brody's already laughing, so I know where he's heading, right? And so he goes, it was so great, Mimi, because my dad goes in the kitchen, and he starts to pull out. You know how you pull out your Taco Bell bag. You know, you're checking which, whose is what, and you know, all of that. He pulls it out, and so he's looking, opening up each one to see, in fact, is every order right? 
and he sees the one that's got a bite taken out of it. And Brody said, I hear from the other room, oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> it's like, no way. And he said, my dad is now boiling. He's just so upset. Like, I can't even believe he would do this. And so, anyway... Uh, long story short, obviously he didn't go back there, but he finds out that Candace, in fact, had taken the bite and all of that. But Brody, in the midst of that, says this to his father. You know, Dad, you can't see your reflection when you're boiling. It's a good word. He's a very, very astute young man, okay? And so whether he saw that on social media or whatever it might be, but even for my son-in-law to receive that from his son, that's precious. That really is precious. So there's so many ways we could go with that with regard to our kids are watching us, you name it, all of that. But what an opportunity, right? What an opportunity. And so we don't want to give the flesh well, all that it demands because it will make its demand all the time. And so, when we cleanse the body, though, guys, we cleanse our mind and declutter our spirit, man, right? Removing distractions so we can better focus in on who? Him. To hear. To truly hear so that we can obey quickly. So, we know this, right? Fasting does not change, nor does it move God. It does not change, although you'll see examples, and in all the 21 scriptures we're going to give you for every day, you'll see examples of men of God that literally fasted like David in order to beg God to save his son. But fasting does not move God. It does not change God. It doesn't. It changes us. It changes us. Fasting is a spiritual dis discipline that is to move us into his presence. It is not an end in and of itself, right? Otherwise, it's a work of the flesh, right? It's simply a mode of transport, guys. The time that we would have spent on the things that we are fasting from should ideally be replaced by spending time with him, right? And so we're proposing, again, this 3, 10, or 21-day fast. It may be food. It may be electronics. It may be caffeine. It may be online shopping. It may be some compulsive behavior. It may be cussing. It may be literally anything that has garnered your attention, causing distractions and disruptions and your spirit to be cluttered. For me, the Lord has called me on a 21-day fast, okay? Um, <clears throat> added to what I've employed in the last year, which is intermittent fasting. In other words, I was having trouble on a health level, and I'm saying this specifically so that we can understand the difference between a cleanse, right, for health purposes, and a fast, and there's a different function for both. Both are good. Spirit of God can lead us to do both. But an actual fast is, is biblical, right? It's biblical in nature. And so <clears throat> with that in mind... Uh, I only eat within an 8 to 10 hour swath of time to give my GI tract time to rest. That is a point of obedience for me, much like when I reached out for the Coke Zero and the Lord said, not another drop, right? In that moment that he said, not another drop, grace came to be able to obey him in that. And then as a result, weeks later, remember, I had that wonderful report that I'd had Barrett's esophagus and it was gone. I'm telling you, obedience... Man, the Spirit of God is doing a, a deeper work in us as the body of Christ. And as a result, he will meet us. And things that maybe have kept us ensnared for a long time can be eradicated in this new year. That should be hopeful to us, right? And so... <clears throat> But he's called me to this specified Daniel fast. And so for me, it's real simplistic, guys. Just removing meats and sweets and water only. Meats and sweets and water only. Okay? And that's okay. No caffeine. I realize, and I'm asking the Lord for mercy, that we don't have that caffeine he headache right back here. You know, the one that could just like wrap around your head and you feel like an imp is on you. Anyway, but lots of veggies, fruit, beans, nuts, whole grains. These are good things for our body. And think about this. There's not a lot of cooking involved because they're whole foods, right? So as a result, I'm getting to spend that time that I would normally meal prep with the Lord. So I got it. I didn't understand, firstly, why he was prompting me that way, but then I understood. Then I understood.
And so eating those whole foods not processed is really good for us healthy and that's a health wise and that's a great thing, but that's not my goal, right? That isn't my goal. My goal is the time, the th that swath of time that I'm given as a result to be able to spend with him. And so remembering partnering together with fasting is prayer right? So it's not necessarily, not that it's bad by any means to read the word while you're fasting, right? Or to worship while you're fasting. But I really encourage you to make much of prayer and praying by the spirit while you're fasting because you're communing with God and you're wanting to hear from him, right? You're tuning, if you will, tuning your spirit to be in line or in alignment with his spirit who lives big, I pray, on the inside of you. And as a result, they together are enabled to move you over into your next season, right? You're positioned to be able to hear so that you can obey and be readied to move into that next place because you're receiving the ball, you're pivoting and you're moving forward, right? Right? Come on now. Amen. All right. So, <clears throat> Let's talk about this. When it comes to dreams being found and then fulfilled, there might be gaps. What do I mean by that? There might be gaps in our life. So we have right here, we have our ideal self. This is my ideal self in God. But I'm actually over here, which is my real self. Okay? And there's a gap between where I'm at and what I'm believing God for. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Right? Right? You have dreams in your heart that have yet to be realized. And if you were honest before God, you would assess and say, I wouldn't have imagined my life to be here like this right now. Anybody, anybody, I I'm raising my hand big, right? Can we be this honest? I never would have imagined that the Lord would ask us to downsize to the point that we're living in 240 square feet. There's grace for it. But I'm believing God in a big way to be positioned to have a home again. Is that a godly desire? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. So think about that. That's my ideal dream is to have a home. Because what? I love having people over. I enjoy that, that hospitality, that kind of thing. I'm not the cook, but you know, I enjoy having people in my presence like that. And it's true. And so what about that? Proverbs 13, 12, and I love it in the New Living Translation. And it says this, hope deferred makes the heart what? Sick. It does. It can be a sickening thing to look at our lives and think, I am not where I'm supposed to be. Hmm. Think about that. But that doesn't have to continue to be that way. It doesn't. We have more power afforded to us than what we might think. It's not going to drop like that. There will be step-by-step -step process. But you know what? He will grace us to make the first step and then the next step and then the next step. And before we know it, we are on our way to that ideal self or that ideal picture that in God he placed in us. He placed there. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of what? Life. A tree of life. A dream fulfilled. C.S. Lewis said this, you can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start right where you are and change the ending. Isn't that good? You can't go back and change the beginning, but you can start right where you are and change the ending. And remember, what did God make note of for Abraham? He noted the ending. Didn't even mention the beginning. Didn't even mention where he waffled and wavered. Didn't even make mention of it. Mm. So we can move from reimagining our lives to reinvention. I believe this. It is our superpower, okay? If you need to take that away today that I can reinvent myself, it is my superpower. Why? I'm being silly, you understand. But this word literally means this. It's a verb. It's an action. It means to change something so much that it appears entirely new. It appears entirely new. And guys, he's given us two major gifts that give us decided advantages, right? Decided advantages. So for the one who says that life isn't fair, you're right. Life isn't fair, but God is fair. 
He has equipped us. He has graced us. He has given us everything that pertains to life and to godliness. According to his word in Colossians, he is faithful to watch over that word, to bring it to pass in our lives. Faithful. And if all you can do while you're fasting and praying is say, Father, you are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. If that's all you can do, if that's all you can say in the midst of your frustration, in the midst of your sorrow, in the midst of your realization that you're not the ideal self that you thought you were going to be in that place and at that time of season of life, you can say, God, you are faithful and build yourself to daring to believe him, right? I have always believed that he's the God of impossible, but there's something different about this year. There's something so different about this year. It's as if the windows of heaven have so opened that we are seeing the miraculous happen across the body of Christ and in the world. We are. We are seeing something very new, very strategic. And so I believe this. We can have anything in God that we can dare to believe him for. If it's in his word, if it's a promise for you and I, we can dare him to believe for it. We absolutely can. Faith is being stirred in the body of Christ. That's exciting. You didn't get nearly excited enough about that. No, really. Faith is being stirred in the body of Christ. And so, guys, you can use your godly imaginations, right? Because you're the master of your own mind. You can use your godly imaginations to see yourself as he sees you, laying a foundation for your life's path to follow, okay? Because where your mind goes, we've said it before, your feet will follow, my feet will follow. And so instead of envisioning a negative outcome and outcome the words, and can I be the honest, some of us are really good, that it's such a constant fountain of negativity. Constant. I'm coaching you today, okay? You have got to, like Zechariah, allow the Lord to make your mouth mute, man. I'm telling you what. Shut me up, Father. Shut me on up. Help me with this fast that I can just stop, you know, destroying my future because I keep planting weed seed that the enemy's out there watering, right? And I, he, he's putting people in my life, maybe, for some of us, that are adding to that negativity. But what if it succeeds? What if I win? What if it flourishes? What if it lasts? What if it's restored? What if I finish? But what if good is coming my way? Amen. So I don't care what the devil is whispering in your ear. You and I are the master of our own minds. So we can say, no, what if I win? What if I get that contract, yeah. right? What if I come out ahead? What if I find fi favor? That shouldn't even belong to me. What if? And begin speaking those things. Guys, it's going to change everything. Because it'll change you. It'll change you. So you're positioned in a very different place. It's the law of attraction, right? Spiritually speaking, it's the law of attraction. People that are negative repel people. I'm coaching you. I'm coaching you this morning, right? But people that are excited and inspired draw other people. They do. They do. All right, so come on. Now, if your dream and your reality aren't matching up, how do we move from being a dreamer to realizing that dream to come true? You can use that godly imagination, okay? Now, think about this. Use your godly imagination that your financial situation has changed. It's changed. Stop speaking over your finances. Well, that I have to wait for another check. Well, I can't do that right now. I can't go on that missions trip right now. I can't go back to school right now. I don't have the money for this. I don't have the money for this. I can't afford it. I can't afford it. Stop it. No, seriously, guys. Stop. You're hurting your future. The Lord is doing this in us too. So as challenged as we've been, I'm just sharing the challenge with you, okay? Stop speaking death 
Oh, for your finances. No, if, if, it's, if a bill comes in that you weren't expecting, guess what? Father, I thank you. I can't do it. I can't meet it. But I know you can. And so it's yours. And pray over that thing. Thank him. And whatever he says do, he might have you sow a seed. He might have you do something. He might have you take, I don't know, extra hours of work. It might be a whole host of things. But whatever he tells you to do, do that. Be obedient to what he tells you to do. What about this? Imagining your business flourishing. Imagining your relationships restored, right? Imagining your educational goals realized. Imagining your health regained. Imagining your lifelong goals achieved. Imagine ministry callings opened and advancing, expanding and growing. Imagine all this good. Use your imagination for good because it's godly in him. Okay. James 1.22 says this, but be, what? Everybody say it. Doers of the word. Let's all do that again. But be doers, doers of the word and not what? Hearers. Hearers only. So we are to hear, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And if you look it up in the Greek, it denotes a continual hearing, right? So faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God, right? It's right. It's true. I love you. Such a blessing. But be, <laughs> Linda is the biggest encourager ever. I love it. She is. She is a huge encourager. But be doers of the word and not a hearer only. So what is that is? What is that? I'm hearing the word. I'm hearing the word. I'm hearing the word, but I'm never applying it. I'm not doing it. I'm not living it. Deceiving who? Who are we deceiving? We got everybody else duped in our lives. No, we can see, we can see clearly. Mm, no, because I'm, I'm constantly in the word. I ain't living it, yeah. right? <laughs> Couldn't tell by way of my example that I'm living this or anything, you know. No, no, no. The word's real clear, and we can say it like this. I had an 83-year-old precious saint of God say this to me. Sweetheart, the only part of the Bible that you believe is the part you practice. The Bible that you believe is the part you practice. Whoo. Three weeks before she moved to heaven. No known cause of death. She just moved. I said, oh, that's right. She and her husband both. That was Phil, Fern Halverson said that. Yeah. So we receive that as, as you know, that's the truth there. There's truth. All right. Psalm 37, 4 says this, delight yourself also in the Lord. Matter of fact, guys, while you're on your fast, I'd write that down in your notes. Read the whole chapter, Psalm 37. The whole chapter is such a, just a wonderful, fiery encouragement. I love it. See, Ryan just said it's true. It is true. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall what? Give you the desires of your heart. Now, there's a twofold meaning there, right? He will make them come to pass, but he'll make them come to pass because he planted them there. That's right. He planted those desires in your heart. So I want to say something to you. I had somebody one time years ago come to me and say, you know, I, I believe, can I just be real honest here, right? I'm coaching, right? So we're going to just get real honest. I, I, I want a mate. I want to be married, but it's not happening. So maybe it's not God's plan for me. I said, what's the desire of your heart? To be married. I said, then God pl placed that desire in you. That's right. He placed that desire in you. He's not cruel and heartless to have a desire be planted in your heart according to his word and then dangle it over you and never fulfill it. That's, that is not my God. Mm -mm. He's watching over that word to perform it, to bring it to pass. Now, guys, there might be some things whether it be in that area or some other area, that the Spirit of God is telling you to ready yourself to be obedient in, and you've not done it. I'm coaching you. You all still love me today. It's my birthday, so you have to be loved. You just love me today. That's my birthday present, okay? So it's not really my birthday, but anyway. <laughs> Which, by the way, I got to inject another funny story by Brody, okay? Okay. Here we go. So he says, Mimi, it's almost your birthday. I said, yeah, it is. He goes, so you're going to be 57. Yeah. I think to him that sounds like, you know, 257, you understand. And he goes, and so how old is Papa? And I said, well, he just turned 60. 
So he goes, wow, your father must not have liked that. I said, oh, really? You you think so? And he goes, no, that's kind of like, and he named these two people that are 27 and 54. I was like, yes, that's exactly right, bro. (laughs) No, it was not like that at all. (laughs) Made me laugh so hard. Anyway, oh my goodness, he is a character. Here we go. So during this fast, right, mm -mm -mm, we want to remind ourselves of this. The scripture says in Psalm 37, 4, that if we delight ourselves in the Lord, he'll give us the desires of our heart. And guys, I see Christians do this all the time, and it's a tripping hazard, okay? And they'll quote the end promise and kind of omit the if qualifier. Do you know what I mean by that? The if-then promises in the word of God. If you'll do this, then right? If you'll humble humble yourselves and pray and seek my face, then, right? So there are if-then statements. There are something that's predicated before the promise, and that's our what? Oh, obedience. That's right. That's that obedience word again, all right? So he'll give me the desires of my heart if I'm what? What's it predicated by? If you go and you read that passage, it says trusting, delighting in him, and it even says it this way, feeding on his faithfulness, feeding on it. You're feeding on it. It's a perfect thing to do while you're fasting, feeding on his faithfulness. He says this, and I hear Christians quote this. He says, he'll throw open the windows of heaven for me and pour out such a blessing that I'll not have room enough to receive that. Does that word in there? Yeah, absolutely. It is, right? However, it's predicated by something, isn't it? Being rightly related to material goods, right? Having first things first, bringing a tithe into the storehouse, there's, there's tithers' rights that can be claimed by the believer, right, according to Scripture. And so there's something that's predicated there to throwing open the windows of heaven. He's not going to just land it in your mailbox. I'm coaching you today. You still love me. Okay. So his word says this, right? And we know this is true. And I've heard people say it. Well, you know, the word says that I can speak to mountains and they'll move and they'll be cast into the sea. If I don't doubt and I just speak it, that's what will happen. But they don't go on and read verse what? 25. And it says, and when you stand praying, if you have aught or if you have unforgiveness against anyone, go and leave your gift there at the altar and go and do what? Go and ask for forgiveness. Repent. Forgive them. Walk in love. See, that needs to predicate what we're believing God from, right? We need to keep our love walk in check. need to keep our heart short in that place of unforgiveness. We want to make sure that we keep a short leash with God, if you will. And so all these promises are predicated in some way on our part, that we're obedient to his word. Now, it's not just his word. It could also be something that he gave you as a word, like not another drop, Coke Zero, right? If I were to continue to move into that and blow right past it, God's not obligated in any way, not obligated at all. By his mercy, sometimes he'll, he'll purpose to meet me, but he is not obligated to honor that promise of healing. If I'm going to blow right past it, can I be that straight, right? And I see folks, uh, precious, genuine saints of God, get angry with God because he's unfaithful. No, 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 he's not unfaithful. And so, guys, even if this is not for you today, this will help you minister to somebody else so that they can take these spiritual laws and understand that there is a balance to things. God has a part and we have a part, right? We're the believer, he's the performer. Oftentimes we get that confused. But if we'll just stay in our lane, as Dr. Pamela says, if we'll just stay right where it is, where we're grace called and anointed to be, guess what? He'll do his part. He will always do his part. So praise God. Mm -mm -mm. Now, if you've got, and I trust, your finger, if you will, on the point in your life that you're wanting to dare to believe God for, breakthrough, fulfillment, stepping into, just seeing just a little forward momentum, whatever it is that you can believe him for, if you've got your finger on it, think about this, all right? Pastor Ray Kelly, he was for many decades uh, the, the prayer leader of Living Word Christian Center with Pastor Lynn Hammond, okay? And he just had this word downloaded in his heart, and he titled it, 
Greatness lies within. And it was predicated on this idea that everything starts as a seed, which is what the Lord was speaking to us a few weeks ago, right? And he says this, the Holy Spirit spoke this to my heart. In stillness and quietness, I will continue speaking to each one of you. Even in absolute stillness, I will keep directing and continue moving those obstacles out of the way for you. Man, some of you can reach, just receive this for yourself. To do what I've called you to do. Every gift, every calling, every promise shall be uncovered. It is necessary for the days that we are living in that each and every one, every member of the body would be heard and uncovered, that every call would be heard and every gift would be exposed and brought forth. These are the days when the supplies of my spirit must come forth. This is the time. So by faith, we see that each one of us has a different gift and a different supply. Corporately, we connect as one, united together. Individual gifts and supplies that come will move the church and move the body down this pathway, down these steps going forth. There will be seeing the things that need to be seen and hearing the things that need to be heard. There is what he's saying in that place. And so, guys, that is a beautiful word. If you want a copy of it, I can get it to you. But that is a beautiful word to lay hold of for yourself because this was spoken to the body of Christ. So in a few weeks, guys, we have the Bloom Conference. The Lord specifically uh, called us to call it that on purpose. Everything starts as a seed. But pastors Kevin and Susan Fletcher have a position of authority in our lives that we happily yield to, right? Happily submit to. And every time we gather, I'm going to say something right now that is super important. I cannot stress this enough. Every time we gather, we assemble as the body of Christ. Wherever your shepherd is, the word of God says, they're to know the sheep are to know their shepherd's voice. Now we're talking about Jesus, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, right? We understand that. But there's an under shepherd in the earth that's responsible, according to the word, for your soul. Responsible for your soul. And will stand and give an account. So there is a specified targeted word every time we assemble just for you. Just for you to help you on your course in life. Right? And so in this new year, value that. Uh, oh my goodness, esteem that. And to the degree that we increase in that will be to the degree that utterance increases for us. Because what we value, what we esteem is what we'll receive from. Okay? All right. And so here's the quandary though. We can't hear it if we're not tuned in. Right? We can be physically present and not be present at all. Isn't that the truth? We can have a conversation with somebody and not hear a word they said. True. Absolutely true. I'm so grateful that my father would, he literally would stop talking. Pastor absolutely loves this about me. It's his favorite quality about me. But he would stop talking. If he didn't have our undivided attention and have our eye contact, he would stop talking until he did. And he would wait. He would wait. He was very gracious, very loving. But he would just wait until he had undivided attention. So pastor now, he's like, no, just tell me. No, it's okay. My father was so into that that he would drive down the road, driving, and you're over here. Hey, honey, let's talk. And the road's here. Yeah, it was like that. It was so funny. It was like, Dad, we're in the middle of the road. Yeah, the, the, the striped line is right in the middle of the car right now. So it was one of, one of these things. He was so given to it. It's comical, but it's true. And there's, it's like that, right? So when we come to church or when we're seating ourselves under the word, man, even if you're having to tune in online, be there, right? Like, just like be super present to be there. And so I want to remind us this morning that remember, everything starts as a seed. Scripture says what? That as long as the earth remains, there is seed, there is time, and then comes the harvest. 
right? Jesus is the seed. We know the word is also the seed because Jesus and his word are one. So those dreams, those desires, they started in seed form as a planting in our hearts. And so I'm going to leave you with this thought this morning. I asked the Lord, how can I communicate the way in which we move from being a dreamer only to that of a doer? What is the key? Or is there a singular key? Now, there are many components, but the Lord told me something so practical, it absolutely floored me, and it was this. Moving from a dreamer only to that of a doer is found in our daily routine. Simple as that, found in our daily routine. And so he showed me this. I trust that it's encouraging for you as well. We can ask ourselves and to get real, some of us have daily routines that are actually, if we're honest, destructive lifestyle patterns or habitudes, right? Craig Rochelle calls them habitudes that are infringing on realizing my dreams in him. So you can go ahead and write those down as we move into the fast because he'll be faithful to show you what those things are. He gave me a beautiful list. It was wonderful. It was great. Absolutely. Those things. Now, he also simplifies it, right? Because he wants us to succeed. He doesn't overwhelm us. He doesn't overload us. That isn't the point at all. And so, but by the spirit of God, he said this to me. So I'm asking him. So he's telling me, right? I'm opening myself up for answers. He's given me some answers. He's given me insight on some things. And he said, still others in what what he called the dead zone. And I thought, what on earth is that? So I had to go research it. I knew it was a body of water, but what does this mean, the dead zone? The dead zone is a body of water. It can be a pond, a lake, an ocean, depleted of oxygen. Therefore, it cannot sustain life. However, The trick of the dead zone is this. This body of water looks beautiful from a distance. Looks like everything's fine. It looks refreshing. It draws people to its shore. It looks great, but no life can be sustained in it. It's depleted of oxygen. There are so many in the body of Christ that are in that place. Everything looks fine on the outside. It's like one of our former pastors would always say, it's a big pile of dung with pink pink icing on top right? It looks really pretty, but underneath the surface, there's a lot of hurt there. There's a lot of pain and there's stagnation. And so this water is just that. It's brackish and it's stagnant. Nothing flowing into it, nothing flowing out of it. It's defined as this. This brackish, stagnant water is unpleasant, distasteful, and it carries a foul odor. And there are some people in the body of Christ that are in this place. And so I believe this, he is calling our numbers today and saying, man, let me help you put a finger on this thing so that we can be free from it. We can for once and for all unshackle whatever it is that is keeping us bound so that we can move in to this fresh future that he has for each of us guys. And so pastor Mac Hammond says this successful people do daily what unsuccessful people do occasionally. Man, sit on that, right? And so for me, the Lord spoke to me, and he spoke about my morning routine. For years, I gave myself this excuse, but my aunt who raised me was a night owl, and she just kept me up, and that's true. All of that is true. But is my aunt still with me? No, no. Do I have a born-again experience in Christ? Does God live on the inside of me? Has he graced and equipped me with the power to choose? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Do we have the ability, the free moral agency to decide our futures? Yes. Now, guys, there are lots of things in in life that are out of our control. But when I go to bed, that's in my control. That's in my control. How I start my morning, that's in my control, isn't it? Absolutely. The routines that I allow in my day, that's in my control. And so then he very specifically told me exactly what to incorporate. It was just five things, just five things in the morning that I'm to incorporate. Some of those things I'm already doing, but I would do them at other times of the day. But he said, set your course for the day, and therefore you set your course for your life by starting it first things first. First things first. Amen. 
Glory to God. And so remember, what did Pastor tell you that T.D. Jake said Friday before last? Nothing more powerful in life than a made-up mind, right? Consistency is key. Can we stand to our feet this morning? Thank you, Father, man. Thank you so much, guys, for the opportunity to, to coach you this morning. Seriously, that sounds so funny. I realize that. But, Father, we receive your word as just that. You are not only our good, good father, but you are a coach, you are a mentor, you're our shepherd, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd. Oh, Father, you're the cornerstone of our life. And so, Father, we thank you that every exceedingly great and precious promise in your word, it is good. Your character is good, and you're watching over your word. And so, Father, I just, right now, let's just get real quiet, guys, and just ask him to show us. Maybe for you, maybe it's just one area, it's just one thing that he wants you to pivot on, that he wants you to change, that he wants you to cut off, that he wants you to lay aside, that he wants you to fast from, whatever it is. Whatever it is for you, he is so individualized and so unique, he's able to speak to each one of us just that way. And so receive that right now. Whatever it is that he's saying, I want you to be free from what? Fill in the blank. Father, we declare freedom freedom, 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 free at last, free at last. Thank God almighty. We are free at last. And father, we make that dec declaration out ahead of, of time, out ahead of ever seeing anything change. Father, we just make that our truth. And so father, I thank you that each one steps into this grace to be able to complete this, this fast. But father, moreover, more than that, that, Lord, that they would carve out time in the first of their day to spend time with you. And, Father, it would set not only their day, but it would set their year on course. And when we put first things first and we seek your face first, everything else comes into line. Father, thank you that your gospel is simple. Thank you that any one of us can receive it. We receive it as the truth, the immutable, unchanging truth. And we trust you, Lord God, that you're bringing us through to the end. We have endurance, we have perseverance, and Father, you're training us in obedience. You're fine-tuning our spirits by the Spirit of God living big on the inside of us. And we thank you, Father, that we're gonna come out of this, the other side having been made better, freer, stronger, more sensitive to the Spirit of God. And Father, we speak to those callings, those dreams. Father, I pray that there is a stirring right now. Down on the inside, there is a stirring. And that stirring is filled with hope. It's filled with fresh hope by the Spirit of God. There is an excitement that is stirring down on the inside of you. Gone are the days of oppression and discouragement right now in the name of Jesus. Get up out of that grave. Get on up and say, this is a brand new day. It's a brand new way. And I'm going to step over into it by faith. I'm going to have everything that he's called me to have, everything that he's called me to do, and everything that he's called me to be. You know, and man, over the last week, guys, I keep hearing this, and it sounds so funny, but I, I trust that this will, this will land in your heart and make sense. But there's some of you, it's like we're in three categories. It's as if this. Some of you are being called to step in. Others of you are being called to step up. And there are others of you that are being called to step out. Whatever that means for you, you grab a hold of it, and you trust him that he'll show you with great detail exactly what you're supposed to do. Thank you, Father, that you order our steps. You are the captain of our lives, and we trust you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we can be seated. Guys, I just want to tell you, thank you so much. You know, 
I am confident you um, couldn't possibly have any idea how much we value and appreciate you, sincerely. You absolutely make our week. I know we do this as under the Lord, but the bottom line is, is if we don't have the body of Christ, there is no family of God, right? It's brick and mortar. And, and what's a building without the church? That's it. And so thank you, thank you, thank you. God is faithful, and he's faithful to watch over whatever it is that he brought to your forethought today. Whatever it is, he is faithful to deliver you and to bring you out into, oh man, the fullness of what it is he's planted in your heart. So glory to God. Ooh. I scared you. I scared. Well, before we go, it is actually her birthday coming up. Uh, so, uh, she already told us she's 57, beautiful. So, uh, that's a good thing. So, why don't you come on in, Kim, and uh, I'll, take I'll, I'll take it the rest of my life. That's a good thing. So, Kim was so gracious. I'll give her the credit. She, uh, she, she got you flowers, which is so sweet. <clears throat> I could have pawned it off that I got her flowers. I didn't. Uh, what are we doing? Oh, oh there's, uh, there's only one candle on there to light. That's uh, not a problem. So uh, we're just going to sing happy birthday. To you. No cannons? We don't have cannons. Aren't these beautiful? There's a milestone birthday. And look at this. Isn't that sweet? Well, let's sing happy birthday. Reds, lead us in happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Denise. Happy celebrate birthday to you. Yay! Yeah, you got. Oh, did you get those funky ones again?